I'm Steve for This Up With Cars and this is the 2023 Land Rover Defender 90 P400 X-Dynamic SE Defender Trophy Edition. And this is another car guy review. So if you're wondering how many restraints and lumbar adjustments the seats have, this is not the video for you. I don't work for any magazine and I'm not obligated to tell you any certain thing about this vehicle. So I'm going to go over the vehicle and tell you what I think is important. First I'll do a walk around and we'll take a look at the inside, outside, and under the engine bay. And then I'll put it up on my lift and we'll find out how it works. Lastly, I'll take it for a drive and tell you what I think about it. I think first we need to address what's going on here with all these colors. This is a white vehicle. The yellow is a wrap and the black right here is also a wrap. And actually this makes a lot of sense because in a, for an off-road vehicle, when you're going through trees and stuff, you get a lot of marks in the paint. And this wrap is very, very thick. So I think that's actually good protection if you're going to actually be using this off-road. And these come with the optional protection right here. So you can set things on your hood. Now on the front of this thing, I think all of the little ports, looks like a brake duct down there. I think these are all here for function and not just for looks. And I really like what they've done with the winch. The winch is hidden there behind the grill. And then this panel right here comes off and that exposes your hook and where the cable comes out. Let me take that off right now. It's just two screws that you quarter turn on the bottom. There's one right there, another one over here. And if you don't wanna have your hook on it, it's really neat that they included this you can wrap your cable around, hook it onto this pin, tighten it up, and it's all secured underneath this cover. I'm using a little stubby screwdriver, but you could probably use a quarter to get these off. And just pull it from the bottom. And there's, there's two pins up here that hold it secure. I prefer the look of having the hook visible, but if you know you're never going to use it, it's probably better to have the cover on and protect everything, protect it from getting grime in there. But if you think you're going to need it, it probably doesn't make sense to have this plastic cover over it. This is a very nice worn winch, and it does come with a wireless control. One of the neat things is you can set it to free spool here on the remote, and you can do that from inside the cab. So if you have a spotter and they need to pull this out, they don't have to come over here and flip a lever. It's all electronic, and then you can re-engage it and then move your winch in and out, all from the driver's seat, or of course you could give this to the spotter. You could do this from outside the vehicle as well. Let's take a look under the bonnet, and to do that, they have a really nice big lever, easy to find, pull that. I really like that. I don't know why manufacturers always try to hide the hood release. Under the bonnet in the engine bay, the first thing to note is that there is no battery in here. But if you do want to jumpstart this car or use this car to jumpstart another car, you do have your ports over here. You have your positive terminal in here and your negative terminal right there. This engine is a three liter inline six and makes just under 400 horsepower. It has a turbocharger as well as a supercharger. But things are a little bit different on this engine than what you typically see. This is actually a mild hybrid. And this is also a Euro 6 engine. This engine actually doesn't have a starter. It has a combination smart alternator and charger all in one unit. And that I think makes starting the engine much quieter and seems to be effortless. So you might be a little bit confused. So let's go over this real quickly. This car has a 48 volt battery and that's located in the back of the vehicle. It then has a DC to DC converter to provide 12 volts to all of the things that need 12 volts. When this engine is not using a lot of power for pushing this car down the road, it can use the alternator in order to recharge the battery. That power is then stored in the battery to be used to run the supercharger so that the engine can run very efficiently until the turbos have spooled up. And that's why it's called a mild hybrid. It doesn't use any electrical power to drive any of the wheels. All it does is store that energy to be used in the supercharger later. It will, of course, also use that energy to run the starter alternator to restart the engine because the engine will shut off when you pull up to stoplights or you are stopped and the engine is not needed for the climate control. 
Usually I really dislike the start stop systems, but this one seems to not get in the way. And not having a battery in here has opened up a ton of room over in this area. Here we have the reservoir for our washer fluid. And one thing to note on the shock tower, you can see the lines and controls for the air suspension system because this car can lower itself to get into smaller spaces and it can also raise itself up three inches to clear obstacles. Moving along, we of course have our oil fill cap, our radiator cap. On this radiator hose above the fan, we do have a bleed spot for the coolant. So when we've had to refill the cooling system, we can bleed the air out right here. The air filter, and where is that drawing in air from? The air filter is drawing in air from the inner fender over there. It looks to be sucking air from this vent here. It must travel along the inner fender over to the air box. Right behind the air filter is the ports to service the air conditioning. It's nice to see these in an easy spot to reach with a lot of clearance around them. Here we have the engine oil dipstick. And behind that, underneath these grates, is the master cylinders. So you just spin these little fasteners here. Then we can remove that panel. Fortunately, we will need the screwdriver for these up here. With that panel off, we've gained access to the brake reservoir. And the wiper motor is located down there. So should your motor go bad, it looks like it's not too bad to replace. And one thing I noticed when I was taking this off, this is a really thick piece of plastic. This is not as flimsy as you normally see from manufacturers. So I'm really impressed with what they made here. On the inside of this vehicle, things are a little reminiscent of the original Defender. One thing we don't have is a bench seat in the front. It would have been kind of neat to have a bench seat. My Series 3 Land Rover might be small, but it has three seats going across, and I think that's some of the charm of this truck. Just like on the original Defender, we have these trays, and the shelf goes all the way across over to the other side. Here in the Series 3, you can see the original tray that would go across underneath the dashboard of the Land Rover. There's some nice grab handles up here. There is, of course, outlets. You have a 12-volt outlet here, USB outlets. There's wireless phone charging right here in front of the center console. This model does not come with the optional fridge in the center console. This model does have a sunroof, which I think is kind of silly. I don't think that off-road vehicles really should have a glass roof like this. But it does open up. That would be nice for ventilation on really hot days. And you also have the shade which you can close to keep the sun out and keep it a little bit cooler in here on those really bright days. Moving back, we have the ladder to get up to the roof rack. It's kind of neat how this works. And it's actually really sturdy. And being on the side, that lets you get to the front and the back it, rather than crawling up the back of the Land Rover and then you'd have to crawl over everything to get to the front. But being on the side gives you access to the whole roof rack, especially on a D90. In the back, the Defender Trophy has two tow hooks. And this is really nice because normally you have to use something that goes into your trailer hitch down there, which is going to hit the ground first here in the back. And of course, if that's in the mud or underwater, it's nicer that you have a higher tow point that you can use. These do have a badge that tells you this is one of 220. In the back, there's an air compressor that you can use. You can dial in the pressure that you want your tires to be. And it comes with a bag that has your hose and your chuck for airing up your tires. Also comes with a bunch of fittings for airing up balls and mattresses and things like that. You also get a worn winch accessory kit. It has everything you need to do a successful recovery. And this truck has a built-in inverter as well. So you have AC power. The British are known for good electrical engineering. So it's nice that they put three different voltages in this truck. I don't think there's anything that could possibly go wrong. And then down here, there's a 12 volt power outlet. So if you want to put a fridge back here, you have both 12 volt and your AC voltage available to use for your camping fridge. Like I said before, this truck has air suspension on it and you can lower 
and raise the back of the truck up just from here, which is helpful if you are using a trailer. So you can lower your trailer hitch, get the ball off of it, move your trailer back, and you can raise and lower it right here. You don't have to go and pull forward and back. And if we remove all this stuff and get to the toolkit, there's some neat things to show under there. In the back, we have the jack and the lug nut wrench, but this styrofoam comes out and we can gain access to what's below. Underneath the tools, we have this cavity down here, and right here is our 48 volt battery. That does extend quite a bit back there. Then over on the right, we have our DC to DC converter. This takes the 48 volts from the battery and it converts it to 12 volt for the accessories and the things on the vehicle that need 12 volt. And I think it also takes the 12 volt if you are going to jumpstart this truck and converts it to 48 volts so that you can charge up the battery here. If you want to put this truck onto a battery tender, you just need a regular 12 volt battery tender. Try to get one meant for lithium batteries and the converter will automatically convert that 12 volt into 48 volts and charge the battery up. And that's really interesting. During the manufacturing process, they must have someone standing on these devices because these are definitely shoe prints here and there is no way that you could stand on those after the vehicle has been assembled. So I'm guessing on the assembly line, they're making people stand on top of those devices to reach something. If we slide the seat on the right side of the vehicle forwards, there's a panel we can remove under the seat. We pull that out. There's a 12 volt battery hidden under here. Imagine this battery is used for the things that run when the car is off such as the remote start, the keyless entry, things like that. I love the location of this battery because it would make running devices inside the vehicle really easy to wire up. Having access to high current 12 volt sources both in the vehicle and under the hood are great for adding accessories later. There's also a second one of these panels under the left hand seat, but in there instead of a battery you will find some computers. Now let's put the 2023 Defender Trophy on the lift and find out how it works. Starting up front, we get a good view of the underside of the winch. There's that place where you can hook the winch cable up to. If we keep traveling down, it's surprisingly flat underneath this vehicle. And that's good, not only for having these plates to protect things, but also for fuel economy. The suspension looks like it's made of very beefy cast aluminum parts. Right up there, the gray link behind the black part, that is the lift rod. And by changing those, you can actually change the height of these vehicles. So if you want to give this vehicle a one to two inch lift, you can get different lift rods and put those in place in all four corners and it will permanently raise up the vehicle. Not only that, but your air suspension will still work to both raise and lower it the same amount that it did before. But this time you have a higher starting point. The front brakes are just massive, and it's really surprising that you can fit an 18 inch wheel around those. These are 19 inch wheels here. And of course, this isn't even the highest horsepower engine. You can get a V8 in the Defender, and just like the G-Wagon, these Land Rovers, you can get a lot of power in them, so you need really big brakes to stop them. It's really surprising that the Jeep and the Bronco Raptor uh, don't upgrade their brakes to really big brakes when they stick the big engine in them. These holes up front do go all the way through, and it looks like that is actual brake ducting. There's no hose connecting it straight to the brake but there's also this little scoop directing air over to the brakes. It's really surprising how flat this vehicle is. It doesn't feel like the wheels are hanging down from the suspension all the way over. It's completely flat. So that means once you raise your suspension up with the air suspension, this entire center section is going to go up that three inches. And really you'll only have just a small area over here that's not going to increase in height that you can get caught on things. 
Looks like we have some really nice jack pad spots on each side behind the wheels. Look at that, even says Defender down here on the skid plate. It's actually a decently strong material. A rock could definitely bash through that if you dropped it on it hard enough, but these plates are a lot stronger and thicker than I thought they would put down here. And since we already have all the mounting points, it would be very easy to swap these out for thicker steel plates if you wanted to. It would be just a bolt-up solution. It would only take a few minutes to do. The wheels on this particular model are 19-inch, and this model comes with the off-road tires, which are Goodyear Wrangler All-Terrain Adventures. And these are in the size of 255-65R19. The brakes really fill this wheel out. They look very good in there. And on this model behind the tires, we have these mud flaps. Pretty flexible. They might still get caught on things. You might be able to bend it back, get it caught in the tire. So if you're doing serious off-roading, um, if you're going to be going through something very deep or a lot of rocks, you may want to temporarily remove those. This white thing here is a very beefy lift point. That is a serious piece of steel there. Coming back, there's another one. There's definitely plenty of places to safely lift this vehicle up. To the sides of these under trays, we have some of that fiber material that the manufacturers like to put on their cars. Keep coming back. Looks like we have saddlebag fuel tanks here. The exhaust runs square down the middle of the vehicle. It's a very neat looking exhaust wrap on there. Coming back to the rear suspension, we have massive cast aluminum suspension parts here. This piece right here is a rubber flap. You might tear that off if you're trying to reverse off of some rocks or something. There's also another rubber flap up here. Not quite sure what the function of either of these flaps are for. It's a very good size differential. We have some wires going in the side, probably for the locker. This truck is equipped with a rear locker as well as a center locker. Looking back towards the front of the truck, you don't even see any of that transfer case up there. Just little bits and pieces of it here and there. And the drive shaft is running way up above all of the exhaust. You can see it just peeking out at the rear over here. You're not going to have to worry about hitting a rock and bending up your prop shaft, but you will have to worry about smashing your exhaust. But I'd rather smash my exhaust than bend my prop shaft. Moving further back, here's a good view of the airbags for the rear suspension. And here on the rear, we also have some pretty big brakes. Those two protruding fins off the back side of the caliper are what keep you from being able to put 18 inch wheels on this vehicle. You can shave those down, however, or replace the rear calipers and then you can fit a proper 18 inch wheel on this. And by going to an 18 inch wheel, you can open yourself up to a million different tire options. On these rear shocks, it even looks like they might have external reservoirs. These of course do have an electronic parking brake. There is no mechanical parking brake on the back of the transfer case like there is on the earlier Land Rovers. And making our way all the way to the back, there is actually two exhausts coming out of this vehicle. Looks like you get a seven pin and a four pin trailer electrical connector. And it looks like to get the strength for the trailer hitch, they had to extend that up Oh, looks like six or seven inches up to get to a secure mounting point. That would be another reason you would want to use the tow hooks for recovery rather than the receiver. On the back of the vehicle, you get these gigantic mud flaps on the back. And it looks like it's been working because the weather here is not the best and there's nothing covering the back of this vehicle. There's no dirt or water that looks like it has sprayed up on there. The rear rotors are not as big as they are on the front, but they are still very nicely sized. As far as tire clearance, it looks like we have two inches between the front tire and the front of the vehicle. 
Same thing at the rear. So if you had the correct width tire, you could go with a taller tire on the front. And this is, of course, at normal ride height. We haven't increased it yet. As for the rear tires, it looks like there's about two and a half inches of clearance in the front and at least two and a half inches of clearance in the rear. So you could easily fit a much bigger tire on the rear of the vehicle. Right now the Defender is at normal ride height and it looks like the lowest part underneath the vehicle is about right here behind the front tires. It looks like that is an eight inch clearance to the ground. Now let's take it up to its maximum height and see how much ground clearance we gain. And now at its maximum height, the vehicle is at 11 and a half inches of ground clearance. So we gain three and a half inches beneath the vehicle. Looking underneath the vehicle now, you can see that the wheels are now hanging lower than the rest of the vehicle. These arms right here are not flat with the skid plates like they were before. So this joint is probably three and a half inches now lower than that joint up there. They were pretty much in line before. And all of this is pretty good because over here on the side, you only have about 11 inches of things that hang down lower than the rest of the car now. So we gained three and a half inches everywhere except for the 11 inches on the insides of the tires. With the suspension raised up now, we have a good look at the front suspension. The airbag would be contained in there, and then you can see the little level sensor so that the Land Rover knows the height of each corner of the vehicle. I think one of the first things you notice when driving one of these Defenders, whether it's the 90 or the 110 or the 130, is just how big it is. It feels very tall, feels wide. That's not typical for a Land Rover. I do like that the doors are still really skinny, it feels like it's something that's not typical of what a European car would be. It is a bit windy today and I do feel the wind pushing on me a bit. This Land Rover being the X-Dynamic P400 has almost 400 horsepower and over 400 foot-pounds of torque. Let's see what that feels like. So I pushed my foot down. There was a bit of delay, but it's really taking off now. No problem merging onto highways with this vehicle. I do wish that the throttle response was more instant than that. I'll demonstrate that again. I'm gonna put my foot down and we'll see how much of a delay there is until the vehicle takes off. So down. That was probably at least a good second or more before it really decided to do much of anything. You could probably go in there and reprogram that. Uh, that's normally a computer thing on these uh, drive-by-wire cars that the computer is not actually letting you have good throttle response and that's a safety thing that the manufacturer has built in. Obviously this vehicle can go very fast. I'm not sure what the top speed is. I'm sure it's well over 120 miles an hour. And a Land Rover like this should feel nice and stable at high speed. Here we have a high-speed corner. Let's get up some speed and see how it likes a high-speed corner. This is a 25 mile per hour corner. We're doing double that right now. No problem, grips the road good. Not a lot of body roll for what this vehicle is. Does seem to be more responsive when you are already on the throttle. If you're at quarter throttle or above, then you do have instant throttle response. It's that lag from when you're just idling around or barely pushing the throttle to stepping on it that there's a huge delay. One of the things I like about the Defender and the Mercedes G-Wagon is they are very powerful vehicles and they're made to go fast and be safe doing it. Uh, a lot of the American off-roaders have a lot of problems uh, doing interstate speeds, especially when you modify them and put on big tires or raise the suspension. Obviously, I could raise the suspension three inches on this, and it's not really going to affect its ability to safely go down the road. Let's see how it handles some tighter turns on this roundabout. 
I'll get up some speed, see what the vehicle dynamics are like. Does lean a bit. I felt no push or oversteer, which you would expect because this is full-time all-wheel drive. This is a very powerful vehicle and it needs powerful brakes and luckily they did install those onto this vehicle. So let's try those out. Let's get up to 60 miles per hour, slam on the brakes and see what happens. Okay, we're at 60 miles an hour. Yeah, that stops fast. In fact, I didn't push it all the way down because my stuff just went flying. We're off-road now, so let's try out some of the off-road features. We bring up the applications. We have several things that we can use off-road. We have our cameras. We have this 4x4i application. And this gives us the information about our vehicle at the moment. It gives us our altitude, shows us our suspension. And right now our suspension is down. Let's raise that all the way up. You can see the back of the car is coming up. Now the front of the car is coming up. We're all the way up. It shows us our differential locks, our center and rear differentials are completely unlocked right now. And it also has a little tilt sensor. It also has a feature called wade sensing, and it will alert you to how high the water that you're driving through is getting up to. The two foot 11 inch is the maximum amount of water you should drive through without a snorkel because the air intake is right there. And when we hit the train button, our climate control knob changes so that we can select the type of terrain that we want to be on. All the way on the left, we have eco, then we have comfort, gravel, grass and snow, mud ruts, sand, rock crawl, wade, and then configurable. And then there's also an auto that you can touch on the screen and it will automatically adjust the vehicle for the conditions that you're seeing. So I think we're going to have that one selected. I'll go back to the normal height and we'll leave it on auto. We go into the cameras, there's some pretty neat camera views. Here's a view of the vehicle on the trail that I'm on right now. And we can really change this and move it around the vehicle. So if I wanted to get my tires exactly out of those ruts, I can use this view to move around the vehicle and make sure that my tires are right on where I want them to be. Let's just keep moving around. Check this side. So our rut is over there. And come over and follow that rut. Make sure that I don't fall into it. And these camera angles are really, really helpful. If you are going to cross like a log bridge, something where you needed your tires to be exactly in a certain spot, but you didn't have a spotter with you, these cameras can do a pretty darn good job change to off-road. If we change to off-road we get individual views of both of our tires as well as what is going to come in the, underneath our vehicle. So if we pull up to this water and the rocks here I want to straddle this frozen puddle without falling in. I can watch both of my tires. I'm getting close to the rocks with the left side. So watch those. Make sure Avoid them the best I can. We can also combine all the views together and get a good view of exactly where our tires are. And it's almost like having a camera looking through the vehicle. So I can straddle this watered rut here and make sure exactly where my tires are to not fall over too far to the right into that puddle and just straddle this puddle with my tires. For camera views on a vehicle, I think these are the best ones that I've ever seen. We also get camera views that help with towing. So we have a dot here to help line up our trailer. 
and then it gives us a good view of our surroundings around us. There's also a microphone on the back, so if someone is spotting us with the trailer, we will be able to hear what they're saying. If we go back to the on-road mode, it shows all of our cameras right here, and it shows us which ones we're actually using. So I can switch to the center camera only. I can click on any of the side views real quickly. And of course, this would be really good for also driving through a drive through Maybe they have curbing that's real tight on both sides and you don't want to, to hit it and scuff up your wheels. I wish that they did have more skins for the Land Rover pictured here. It would be really neat if it looked exactly like the one that you were driving. But now I'm just nitpicking. I still have the vehicle in automatic mode. We have some pretty deep snow here. Both my center and rear differential have locked. Let's switch over to that screen. You can see that they are locking and unlocking very quickly as I need it. They're both unlocked. Rear one locked center locked and I'm not feeling that I'm not hearing that it is completely doing that without me even knowing it right now I am at the normal ride height and it's bumpy of course but it's not uncomfortable let's raise the vehicle up all the way and see if the bumps get harsher I think being at maximum height is a bit harsher so if you want comfort while you're off-roading don't go to the maximum height of your suspension unless you really need it. And that's just a good rule anyways because it won't let you get stuck into a position that you can't get yourself unstuck. If you're at normal height and you get stuck, you can choose to either raise up and, and remove yourself from that obstacle or raise up if you've looked and seen if you can actually go further. Let's try out the sand mode. So with the sand mode selected now, if I give it a bunch of gas, we should spin the tires. Let's see what happens. Yeah, we were definitely spinning some of the tires. I'm not sure which ones, but we even got a little sideways there. This vehicle is a bit noisy. Uh, I don't know if you can hear the rattling, but there are some rattles from the vehicle. And at high speeds, the roof rack on the top does make some noise. But what are my final thoughts? Would I buy one of these? Uh, actually, I would, and I did. This one is mine. So we can explore the capabilities of this vehicle, and I'm really excited to take this out and actually give it some challenging terrains and see how it does. If you want to see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe.